They updated the, the major version number. This promises to be good. <laughs> I must admit, I was seeing what's new in Postgres. I'm like, stop reading. I want to go to this. I didn't actually see the 10. Doesn't matter what version it is, right? Well, the most, the, the last couple of versions have had interesting things added to them that are useful. But 10 being a major version number promises potentially major features and or important rewrites. Sorry. No problem. Big enough? Yeah. Much better than that first one. It uh, came off with all of the teeny little 6.5. <laughs> oh, jeez. PowerPoint Titus. <laughs> yes, well, I, I tell all of my students um, that basically, never mind whether PowerPoint is really done on the computer or not, print out your slide, your business slides set them on the floor, stand up, looking down. If you can't read every word on there, your audience won't be able to either. Yep. And I mean, that was the rule that we learned when we were still So here's reading. a different way of doing it that does not require printing them out. Leave your preview window for the slides at the default size. Without moving closer to your monitor than you normally sit, can you still read on the preview slide? Windows 10, I didn't get all of the sounds shut off the way I like. I hate computers, as you said, people didn't get to it by that. But it seems like every time they update the operating system, 
Okay. So it resets some setting that you configured that yes. you wanted. Yes. yes. And uh, man, that too is another configuration file. Yep. What's something that's a default? And what's something that the user expressly said, "I want this," or "I don't want that." Sorry, everything is gone. Yeah. Also, why are you using a nav system inside of your car instead of on your cell phone? Because the driver in the house who refuses to ask directions would use the one that's built in. I have a solution for that. Don't let them drive the car. All right. It's a little I'll come check with you, guys. I don't have cell service. That's horrible. <laughs> so I gotta get close to the window. I don't oh, see okay. a feature. <laughs> <laughs> so well, do you have a contribute to this? Uh, because do you have like a certain you know, life goes better area? Than well, once happy. upon a time, I did a lot of benchmarking stuff. Oh, yeah. A lot of um, uh, I would use the scalability now testing and large systems. Over the car, but but, uh, not so much these days. Oh, yeah. So you're just consulting now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do. I live in the Portland area. So if there are events going around that are close enough, I try to help out. <laughs> like well, helping on a different aspect at the same time. Um, but otherwise, uh, the day job is really just consulting and, okay. and uh, support stuff. And so also, aren't you guys supposed to like? So, as most people at Second Quadrant, right? do they contribute towards like Postgres, or is it just? Well, we do have. We definitely do have a number of people who do. Not everyone does. Um, just like uh, well, a lot of us do multiple different roles. But not everyone does everything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it's going to be. I do a lot of different things, but like jack of all trades, but master of none kind of deal. Yeah. I hope I either get up Yeah, I mean, we, we, do, um, we do actually have a number of, of, uh, of committers, actually. Oh, really? Um, but, you know, not, not that that doesn't really well, say. Well, being a committer, there a lot of them are active in, in well, the code development. Have. Unless it's not, not to say that this you know, we're driving all the development. Yeah. Now is it? I can't remember. Is it written in C? Yes. Okay. Well, every generation on average lives longer. Um, is there seem to, it seems like there's an uptick in uh, versions like faster. Yeah, about faster. Well, I suppose about, that's um, 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 at this point it's nine point two is just out. Like it seems like year two years ago. Yeah, I remember the 9 car is two, I think it was yeah, 9 2 release. 9 um, no, it was 9 3 release. I don't know. Yeah. I that think um, actually had more problems in it than, than uh, people are prompted. I am really well, well, uh, well, to admit. Oh, really? yeah. and, uh, yeah. I think that release took yeah. extra time. But um, I, I want to say it was five, I six years ago. Like the the developers were kind of on a, yeah, we'll, we'll try to do this for this one here. But um, they, actually, they actually did try to pick it up a little bit. They were trying in a 10 month cycle, but I don't mean it for another day. But they actually have been trying to cover it. Oh, really? So you get over there to the left. It sounds like I said 9.6 just came out recently, right? Yeah. But, well, and, and 10 is probably not coming out until later this year, to be honest. Yeah, I think so. So is there a huge difference between like jumping from nine to, to ten? There can be with a lot of well, sure, right? We're going to talk about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> See, you know, uh, uh, but the other reality is that well, some of the things aren't always that good. Yeah, they could be some. And there's still interesting. Generally, isn't most is it going like more of elastic search kind of? Uh, I've read a lot, read a lot of changes in the tech field with searching technique as far as you know. Um, text search rather than full text search. Or, I, just, I actually don't think I touch any on any of those necessarily on those, but um, yeah, there there are. Yeah, it's probably on paper Well, actually, nine six had one. I remember had, had oh, yeah, some so fun, extra functionality that. added. That um, what was it? Someone was just talking about it. 
Yeah, that, that improves some of the full text yeah. searching. Yeah, unless you want to get some extra details. flexibility in how, wow. how you search. Mr. Washington right. Well. And I can't remember Between, if that was a result um, of like a new index type. Like passes. 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 Yeah, more fully. Um, yeah, right. yeah. No, it, it yeah so that's, that's one of the items I actually um, see on here. That's just one of those intractable sucks. Yeah, I thought it was sort of funny. <laughs> Hash index is being neglected <laughs> for, for so long. I mean, yeah. I mean they do um, have AUs. Right. <laughs> it would be more of a, I'm not familiar with all the various types. I mean, I know of them. I mean, you only would make the, the hash into the Now, if you were in a smart hybrid, hybrid, it might be able like to realize, oh, you're going the, up here. The primary um, case is, is if you're looking for a lot energy on the other side. So, I want to uh, say a specific a value is a little too restrictive. So I mean, so going after a, uh, the quality. I think I think the quality is the, the best general term. Quality is there. You don't want to look for a range of things. If you want to look for a range of some numbers greater than a thing, hash is useful. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, hash index is a little bit of a engineer as if you're looking for something specific. Basically, yeah. so, the, okay. so, so if you're not using my curve, a buffer for so that, that, that is the longer term storage. Right. Right. So, so the real specific example is if you have, if you know your data set is always 1 through 10 and you're always looking for 5, or you're looking for a 5 or a 4. So that, that is a slightly oversimplified of, of what a hash index would be, but that's really the most basic example of the type of thing that a hash index is, is suited for. Um,
or at least the stuff I'm going over is supposed to be stuff that everyone should be able to do. It's much less deficient and far it's more thorough. It's such a trench of reading bios that there is a hookup yeah. in a known secured way and transfer power that way. Yeah. Which means yeah. that the place that you should focus on recharging these vehicles is when humans take it. Do I wait for your cue? Um, those two things are number one, <laughs> the standardized battery format, and number two, leasing that battery. That battery can be a secondary battery. So imagine if, say, 30 to 50 percent of your electric power was in one of these batteries, and you're leasing your battery from the company. So you no longer own this battery, you're just I'm buying a thing that stores power, and when I swap it out, I'm still on the lease for a battery from this company, but I'm also paying a small fee for the recharge. <laughs> and you can even do a thing where you charge off of those batteries, or you're charging the car's main battery at the same time that you're swapping the secondary battery. Hello, everyone. I think. Uh, get started here. Um, so my name is, is Mark Wong. I'm a consultant with Second Quadrant. I've been a contributor to the Postgres project over the years. Um, I am here to uh, uh, talk about what's what to expect in Postgres coming up later this fall. So how, is everyone uh, use Postgres now? Anyone uh, thinking about switching? Or, uh, to or from? <laughs> I, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go both ways. How many switching, anyone switching from, planning on switching from Postgres? Anyone uh, uh, planning on switching to Postgres? <laughs> uh, how about, how about uh, uh, to also help me get a better feel, how many folks are, are DBA type versus uh, application developers? That's a hard distinction to make these days. Both? Yeah. 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 You can read yeah. them twice, it's all right. But full spec. Jack of all trades. <laughs> Pointy hat. Or uh, oh, one pointy hat. Any any other uh, any other type pointy that hats. I missed? Yeah. Hey, pointy hats or pointy yeah. pointy hairs. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So so uh, well, how about um, how how many people try the betas and stuff before the releases come out for Postgres? Um, <laughs> anyone on nine six now? Uh, I think on one of the servers. In which environment? Oh, it doesn't matter. Doesn't oh, matter. Okay. If, you, if you're using it, it it's like in dev, it's it's dev, it's not box. Yeah, yeah there's dev boxes. <laughs> so so how, uh, how about another game then? Who who thinks they're using the oldest version of Postgres now? Ooh. Anyone wanna? All right. How how anyone using um, something older than nine oh? We got. I think I'm. That old, huh? Yeah, it's eight, it's eight something. <laughs> Somewhere in the eight, but it's probably eight, eight four. Eight four. Yeah. If you're on eight, it's probably eight four. <laughs> but, but some people are using some of the earlier uh, nine point oh versions right now. Though. Definitely a nine four. That was one of the Debian stable versions at some time. I have a nine two. Someone someone forgot to put a, a minimum version. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then now for, for you guys who are using some of the older ones, are, are you looking for reasons to upgrade or, or are, you, are you guys? Um, in those working? cases, the applications that are presently running on top of it um, don't really demand more. However, if the end users that are using it in addition to those have a use case from a future version of Postgres, then I would be inclined to upgrade. <laughs> So some, some of the things I'll show today will, will hopefully um, that pique your interest in thinking about getting to a later version. Um, we like to think that every major version gives everyone at least one reason to think about upgrading, but although at the same time we recognize that upgrading between major versions is never a trivial task. Uh, so, so where we are right now is, is uh, well, 9.6 is the current version. 
if everything stays on track, I think uh, the version 10 beta could be any month. I don't know necessarily about any day. And um, if things go well with the beta and the release candidates, we could be looking at version 10 early in the fall. And of course, uh, uh, community loves it when people try out the beta versions and the release candidates to help track down any uh, uh, brokenness and whatnot. So how, how many people feel strongly about version numbering? So if, if uh, you may have noticed, uh, previous to version 10, Postgres has gone by a two number, major number versioning scheme. 9.1 versus 9.2 are considered major versions. <coughs> and then um, uh, what, what Postgres likes to call a minor version would be that third number. Uh, 9.1.0 would be the first release in the 9.1 series, and 9.1.1, 9.1.2, and so <coughs> on. And um, those minor numbers are considered binary compatible unless one of the issues between them was a binary compatibility uh, <laughs> issue. So, but then um, uh, there's never been any, any promises about, and I don't think there's ever has been any binary compatibility between the major version numbers, between like a 9.0, 9.1, and 9.2. So um, after many years of long heated debates, Postgres has decided change to a um, two number scheme where the first number is the sole major version and the second number will be that minor release. So from henceforth, there will be a 10.0 and a 10.1 will, will be considered a minor version release. And um, the next major release will be uh, 11, barring any further changes to the numbering scheme. So where, where this gets kind of important is um, uh, there are years of software, or, or uh, what's, what's the right word I'm looking for? Um, third party applications looking at versioning of Postgres. If uh, you use anything that cares very, or that is sensitive to what version of Postgres you're using, um, you may be, have to be prepared for uh, a few headaches while this new version version numbering gets uh, sorted out. But how many people were planning on upgrading to 10 anyway when it came out? Playing with it. <laughs> Playing's okay. Uh, okay. That's good. It's, it's good to have a couple bold, bold folks to try the new stuff when they come out. So I'll answer that question slightly differently. I plan to upgrade when it becomes a thing that I can test in a Debian package. Mm. where you take a similar approach to the Mesa libraries, where they jump from, I think it was 13 point something or other to 17 because they went from feature-based to year-based? I think, I think in, in part of this long-term debate, a lot, of, a lot of the Postgres developers, I think, are in agreement about not using a year-based versioning scheme. So um, until that turn, probably not. For, for folks on 9.6, how many have enjoyed the beginnings of a parallel query plan execution? Uh, well, parallelism for the query plan execution. Uh, people, people working have large systems with uh, a lot of processors? Define a lot. Uh, <coughs> double digit? Well, uh, who's filling the model are you going by? Yeah, <laughs> let's let's go by um, uh, logical processors because I think that that's the point of view that Postgres will have on it. It's not going to pay attention to whether they're um, uh, threads, cores versus. Um, so you got any new malware? 
Not explicitly. It's going to rely on the operating system to schedule its its um, processes and those changes. That's yeah. That's also going to be something that's going to rely on the operating system when the user gets set to change. It, it'll be user configurable. You can set to change. What was that? You can set. It'll be user configurable. You can set affinity. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Being able to set the affinity of that kind of stuff is is not going to well. Um, I generally think that applications won't break, fall over if it if uh, someone does an EC one that does that. No, I, I do have a question about this though. Mm -hmm. Will there be a way for the user to inform Postgres how to better div divide its processor threads so that it lines up with the operating system affinity? Mm. Um, I think the short answer is no. Uh, the most that you'll be able to configure is setting a or uh, maybe you, you can set a maximum number of processes that will be spawned globally in Postgres. And you can also set a maximum number of, of uh, processes that will be spawned per um, query, if you will. So for example, if um, <coughs> you typically ran queries that could potentially spawn 10 processes to parallelize a query, you can um, s max it out so that Postgres won't spawn more than 40 total, if I'm making sense. Kind of, but where I'm coming from is I can't think of any current mechanism for negotiating between an application and an operating system that is scheduling resources how to divide the resources in a way that is optimal for the hardware that is beneath it. Yeah. And I think database is one of the types of applications that would drive the creation of such an interface. Right, right. So so Postgres doesn't doesn't provide much more than, than that. And but it will have a max stop kind of yeah. setting. Right. Setting per query. Yeah, I, I think only in Oracle and DB2 do that on their own dedicated hardware at this point. Mm. Single server. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, so depending on how you set those, it is possible that a few queries could um, starve. Is that the right way to put it? Consume the available uh, pool of processes, if you will. That's not really a pool. I that. guess the way you do it now is you actually have multiple servers, and each server would be one of those affinity domains. That is certainly one possibility. You, you could have. Could have multiple instances running on one system, even though I think most people would generally recommend not doing that unless you have a good reason to. No, I mean breaking down your systems so that you have a cluster instead of MUMA in explicitly. Oh. So, different set of problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think uh, more to your question, there's really not too much um, that Postgres can help on that right now. I'm very much looking forward to those features, though. There are some queries where I work that on more moderate hardware take a while to run. Yeah, yeah. So for, and just to recap for, for those not familiar with 9.6, 9.6, uh, the um, only things that 9.6 really parallelized in the beginning, well, being the beginning of, of parallelizing query execution was doing uh, table scans and doing um, some aggregates. So like uh, uh, it was able to parallelize sums, for example, on large tables. Or that, that's where you would see a huge benefit, parallelizing, doing aggregate calculations on large tables. So now um, it's moving into doing scans on feature indexes, on uh, uh, map heap <laughs> scans, merge joins, and non-correlated subqueries. In other words, joins are really where I'm looking at that. Mm. Yeah, so the, uh, in case of non-correlated stuff, sounds funny. It's, it's basically if you have subqueries that are that don't depend on each other, well, getting values from each other in order to process it, those two can just fire off, mm -hmm. do their thing, and then. So is there a new set of weight types that you'll be able to monitor to look at like packet joins? Uh, um, you know, 
you're going to be there's going to be some new waiting going on. Because yes. The subqueries you're going to have to wait for the new all right. that kind of stuff. So you have to kind of monitor that to figure out the problem that is. The answer is yes, but I actually don't. I don't know what they're calling them at, uh, at this point. But yeah, they're they're definitely um, well. Uh, Postgres being the planner in Postgres being cost based. Um, yeah, new new cost types would have been created to for it to, to make those decisions on on uh, should I parallelize this should I or not and um, well, yeah uh, whatever those values are going to be called. Sure. Okay. Oh, and, and if I didn't mention uh, these first few that I'm going through considered um, to be some of the bigger things coming out in 10, and then I'll, I'll kind of um, churn through some of the smaller things that I've selectively picked out, and, and uh, people are uh, certainly, you guys are willing to, or are certainly uh, can interrupt and ask about anything you think I might not have uh, gone over or might. Are these slides going to be downloadable after the talk? Um, I don't have a, a, a if there's a, I don't remember if the uh, Linux Fest guys have a place for us to put these, but um, they have in previous years. I haven't checked this year. Okay, yeah, because otherwise I would I was um, gonna say that with this particular set of information, most of this is coming out of the release notes. Yeah. Um, I like the syntax. This is very nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, otherwise, uh, well, I'm sure I can find a way to make them available. I'm sure you guys can hunt me down on the website. Um, oh, I already forgot that skip slide. Okay, so uh, another another big feature. Who, how, how many folks make use of the table inheritance in Postgres now? Or wish that uh, you could take advantage of the table inheritance? <laughs> how about table partitioning? Any, any folks wish that, that uh, table partitioning was actually easier other than using that inheritance stuff in Postgres? Yeah, I've thought about it. Seems like too much work for not that reward. <laughs> so for, for those of you who, who may not have looked into the table inheritance, um, uh, Postgres for years now has supported a, a inheritance model with tables where you can inherit the table definition of, of an, I didn't say that backwards, did I? Uh, a table can inherit the um, schema of another table and and um, uh, augment it, if you will, by adding additional columns, indexes, and strings, and whatnot. But um, it never really had any formal way of partitioning data, although with the combination of a feature called constraint exclusion, which I hope I'm getting right, because there's something else called exclusion constraint that everyone always gets mixed up, but um, uh, is it able to get some, benef some benefits of of uh, taking, if you will, what what others may call a traditional table partitioning feature. So, um, in version ten, uh, you are able to declare. Um, I'm trying to think of another way of saying this other than uh, what I have written up there, but you are able to explicitly specify that a table is partitioned, as opposed to creating a bunch of tables with um, uh, inheritance rules in them. So, uh, so when you create this partition, it's going to move the rows <coughs> from the main table. Like if you already had a bunch of rows of measurement, mm -hmm. it's going to have to move them over there. And you get rid of the partition, the rows go back. It's going to all handle uh, for you, or you? The short <laughs> answer is no. still a little more remedial than that, um, the, about the automatic partitioning. So uh, for, for those of you who are um, 
familiar with how the inheritance works and so forth. The, the initial state of this declarative syntax is, or this declarative um, partitioning scheme is little more than syntactic sugar now on how you would have done it manually using the table inheritance and setting up the check and string to, to um, make sure the data you want is, or the data in the table, the partition tables are the data that you expect to see in them. So um, to uh, back to that first question, um, when, you, when you create this table, uh, you actually can't insert any data into it yet because you have to create the partitions manually. So um, when you do this initial create table and declare it that it's going to be partitioned by this uh, partition by range on the log state, you have to create, you still have to manually create the various partitions. Um, so this create table measurement of a name that you still need to specify. So here, the example is year 2006, second month. Um, specifying the partition of this table and specifying the range of dates that it's going to hold. Uh, you, you actually can't insert any data into this yet. And then when you create this partition, this is the only data, data that falls into this range is the only data that you'll be able to insert. So is it creating a catch-all partition for if you don't have a partition in the range that the new data is coming in? Is no, you'll, you'll get an insert error. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, so for that syntax right there, is the true date the correct value, or should that be um, a different value, like the actual end of the month? Ah, uh, good question. I, I'm not familiar with how this particular variant of that statement works. You no, that, that's an excellent question because there was a debate on on what the implied uh, uh, meaning of that should be. I would assume it's inclusive and that's a typo, but that also means that I then have to know what the end of the month is for every single month that I add a partition for. Yes, and, and um, I think or you actually, could I use I any so. function to there, determine that? If, if I remember correctly, there there is, um, more than one way, this you can do uh, uh, something else other than the two to be explicit about the. Um, yeah, the it's, it's Postgres. I'd assume you could use any function you want, but then the question is which function is an appropriately um, efficient one for that. Yeah, I wish I remembered this, but um, I I do I do recall that the original proposal of what what that syntax was is not what it is now, and um, it was exactly one, one of the. I would say logically the best answer to that would be anything that you could use in a where clause as a single part of the statement. Well, you could make a like parentheses. Anything you could put between parentheses in a where clause. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> other than just the declaration, like what's changed under the hood? Because I, I, I asked this because we um, having fiddled around with the, the uh, old style mm -hmm. uh, partitioning, um, insert speed, like uh, when the table is partitioned, I was just, I, I don't I don't know fundamentally what the cause of that was. It was just what my experience was, and I was wondering if uh, if there've been improvements, you know, under the hood. Yeah, that, that's that's a that's also a good question. I think um, if I were to guess, and you saw decreases in insert, it's because triggers were set up to redirect the inserts. That would be the only way that um, you could insert to the parent table to. Yeah. Um, and because otherwise, yes, 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 that's what it was. Right, because this was years ago. Already, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, and and the reason I can guess that is because if the application if the application had logic to directly insert the data into the table partition, then then it would right. it would ultimately be no slower than sure than sure data. Okay. So um, so then uh, uh, then where I get to here is is I don't remember if they're. Obviously, you don't need a trigger, but there has to be logic behind this right. to redirect it. So I would imagine it's somewhere in between. It will be right. somewhere in between. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was, a, it was, a, you know, 
basically in the uh, insert speed was half, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, triggers are a big overhead. I guess I, yeah, I didn't yeah. realize that. So that's that's, that's so, good to know. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just to summarize, to create a partition, the data has to be empty. The data, the table has to have no no rows, correct? Uh, otherwise, it will not allow to create partition. Um, well, if as soon as as soon as you declare, oh, as part of the creation of the table, and, and you you declare it a as a table that's going to be partitioned, the the partitions have to be created before data has somewhere when to go. Data, and you insert the data into the table, and yeah. the data automatically goes to the partition. Right. right. Uh, insert it always into the table. So. Right. Yes. Is there a trigger that can fire on the event that there is not a partition that exists yet to house the data? Uh, so I don't know the answer. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. But uh, yeah. but um, um, it seems it seems like a reasonable thing to expect. Trigger on the air condition. Yeah, you'd have to just have. I mean, you could write it if it was like a generic trigger, but right. But at, certainly at some level, you, you can trap for errors mm -hmm. and, and have logic that handles it. Whether whether it's going to be a, a, a trigger on the table or something else. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. So there's not really under the hood any mechanisms that are looking at this and going, we're just going to ingest data and return the transaction as complete, and then we'll go figure out where the goes in the partitioning scheme. Right. You're actually waiting, it's going to rewrite the insert to the appropriate partition table and fire that off for you, and to be massive compliance, right. no real efficiency gain there. Right. Yeah, so and I think another part of the question that you asked originally was, um, about, uh, uh, well, I, th I think I addressed the part about, about inserting data, but then when you delete, you can delete these partitions, right. and that, that um, will delete the data. There's no, there's, it's no uh, automatic. Yeah, there have to be a catch-all project right. to hire a uh, reverse mm -hmm. when you need to be able to do anything right. different. So when you said you can't insert the data into the, if you're using that partition by range statement, then that, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I mean, you just want to have some kind of an event that populate all those things for trying to get or dynamically do it. Just that way you don't have to test it again in two years when they figure out, oh we forgot to add more partitions. Is the did trust the developer for both not just setting your trap data? Um, yeah the catch in my experience the catch all buckets are very bad things. <laughs> <laughs> Lead to very bad things, I should say. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, one so one last note about the, using this declarative syntax is for those of you who are familiar with um, what I will call flexibility in using the table inheritance, uh, there, this actually is a little more restrictive in other ways. So so for example, when you create these partitions. They have to have exactly the same columns. There's no more, no more um, augmenting the table or um, uh, having. Um, let's see, what's the other thing? Um, there's one of the other things that's more restrictive is you can't have a primary key defined on a partition table. Do I share the same with the parent? Uh, no, uh, the parent can't have it. There's no actual primary key at all. Right, so you can still create indexes, okay. and um, so it certainly could have unique. Right, that's unique, a unique index. way of thinking about it. I guess that's not so bad, though. But it has something. It has something to do with. Um, I couldn't do a unique index. It's, it's almost yeah. It's, well, it's, you can add a constraint. Yeah. Else, you still have to get all the partitions to make sure it's in the bar. Right. 
So that there's there are some um, uh, implementation implementation difficulties to support some of those things, and I think I think primary key is one of them. Um, those other features that are coming up could be very useful for implementing that, though. Mm -hmm. And and it's also uh, good to keep in mind that this is the early days of having the declarative partitioning syntax, so um, certainly don't expect it to be like this forever. switch to 10 now, you at least have to put up with some of these limitations for at least a year. And, and are you still able to insult, uh, insert to the uh, parent table? So there's that functionality is there. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so that that triggers. You, you do get that as a, as a um, uh, bonus. No, bonus is not the right, not the word I'm really looking for, but that's a, a feature. Yeah, yeah feature. Right. So, <laughs> are so that you is insert into the individual partitions directly? Yeah, you should, I, I think you should be able to. I don't see why they would restrict that, other than well, yeah, uh, other than um, running into the uh, thing that you would normally expect to like uh, try and insert data with the wrong. Well, we're we're assuming that you're doing things the right way if you're doing that. Yeah. Right. 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 The cluster index is probably. Yeah. Yeah. So you can still cluster index. Got to <coughs> rebuild it. Uh, well, well, I'll get to it later. So um, uh, there, there was one other major thing. Oh, I might as well mention it because there's really uh, uh, not so much detail to it. Uh, how how many folks are concerned about MD5 or authentication, authorized authentication? Is that what I'm looking for? Is it authentication passwords and stuff? Like within like. Authentication of Postgres or yes. Oh, yes. Yes. authentication of Postgres. And it's being like is it because it's weak? Is that yes. what we're yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, raise your hand. Um, so one one of the other major things is uh, and and uh, uh, my understanding of security stuff is, is a little weak, but um, Scram two fifty six bit uh, something. Hopefully I have it on the slide better <laughs> than that, but uh, that's one thing that's going to be supported in version 10 to replace the MD5 stuff or um, in addition to the MD5 stuff. Uh, I, I think they're, well, for for people who do care about security, I think I don't really need to explain too much about having the um, stronger encryption algorithms and mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, so that, that's one area that Postgres, I think, has been a little weak on. And, and uh, it sounds like a lot of people are looking forward to having something stronger Ah, <laughs> all right. So, so how many people have run out of this space on their database by accident? <laughs> Close. Uh, how, how many people delete the logs to query space? And and for those of you who've deleted them, how many times have you deleted the wrong log directory? <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, so for, for folks who don't know, um, the X log directory refers to the transaction logs that are used for um, uh, you know, the asset stuff, the durability and, and uh, transaction safe functionalities of, of relational database. So um, uh, the other default directory was just called PG log. So it's kind of understandable if, if you know, you're uh, suddenly freaking out about running out of disk space and your database shut down Want to cleans up something fast, and why not delete just the log, all the log files, right? Uh, but um, you know, you delete those transaction logs. Now you got a corrupted database on top of. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> now you have some you have some freak space back, but now you got a corrupted. First you had one problem, now you have two. Yeah. <laughs> and unless you have a backup, a bigger problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and and unless you have a backup, um, you're uh, you're basically you know, done at that point. All that data that was in the transaction logs is now thoroughly unrollable. So the reason they call it wall is because that's the um, 
term Postgres uses for transactional logs, standing for write-ahead logs. And um, in times of high stress, hopefully it won't be confused with a regular log at this point. And uh, uh, if you find yourself in a situation where you need a clearance in this space, you, you won't be accidentally deleting some critical information. And this is something that I think uh, people have continually done over the years without um, without knowing until it was too late. So we'll see what fun this creates in the future, and hopefully it'll be uh, for the better. Uh, timestamps. How many folks use use timestamps? Uh, in the um, older days, uh, how many of you folks have used timestamps? Wondered why two timestamps that look equal weren't actually equal. I think I remember that. You think you've seen knowing that? it. Uh, yeah. So um, I can't remember at what point this was, and this was certainly distribution specific, package specific, because some packagers actually uh, uh, change this um, so folks wouldn't run into it the hard way. But basically, uh, once upon a time, the default, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, um, data type, if you will, was uh, using that loosely, that was representing what a timestamp was, was using a floating point representation. But when you actually looked at what the timestamp said, they hour, minute, second, millisecond, even though those look identical on the screen because of how it was represented behind the scenes, they actually weren't equal because of some trailing floating point bit somewhere in, in that. I feel like we should blame Java for this. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think we see the Java. Oh, no. Oh, the, the bug in. Yeah. <laughs> Let's blame the penny instead. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, after years of debate on how to really fix it, certainly the short-term fix was that Postgres could just have been built so that it used integers behind the scenes rather than floating point, but you know, there was still, uh, although probably far less uh, cases where people ran into that wondering why their timestamps didn't, uh, were apparently not equal when they looked like they should have been. Um, so, so that was finally uh, taken care of with uh, absolution. More indexes. How, how many how many folks use more than B tree indexes in their database, or wish they could use more than the one B tree index? Well, I, I shouldn't put it that way. Postgres did support more than one index, but um, those look fine. Yes. Uh, so one one of the um, one of the well bigger long standing things of. Uh, one particular long, long-standing issue was with hash indexes. How many folks are fans of hash indexes? And uh, did it drive you nuts that um, they weren't durable in Postgres? <laughs> so now they are. You can use them and expect them to be in good shape after a crash. But you don't need to rebuild them um, because they. Uh, well, the the crux of the matter was was that. Um, they just weren't ACID compliant. The implementation wasn't ACID compliant in Postgres. So that's why if the database crashed in a certain way, your hash indexes would get corrupted and unusable and you have to recreate it. Um, that is the biggest complaint I think there was about the hash index implementation in Postgres. I think there were some other corner cases where because of the lack of durability that you could find yourself with a hash index that was basically useless. But, so that's been fixed, and um, I think there's also been some general performance improvements with hash indexes. Um, how many, how many JSON, JSONB users? Mm. So, so uh, uh, there has been support for indexing with JSON data types, whether it be functional indexes, well I think they're mostly fun functional indexes, and I think, and I always get this, uh, mixed up. I can't remember if it's both one or the other between the gin and just index. But um, now the indexing, those, uh, all those, well, the full text related 
the indexes that help for full text searching are now supporting the JSON data type. Yes? So instead of indexing the results of a function that turns it back into a string, you can now index it directly? Yes, I think, I think that's what it means now. That's going to help out a lot. <laughs> um, how about how about folks, uh, any, any folks using the CIDR or the INET data types? Um, this one I'm not terribly familiar with, but my understanding was that, that it did support just style indexes on it before, but now you can use the spatial indexes on them. Um, well, I, uh, knowing what the general uh, meaning of what you use a spatial index for, I, I was kind of curious at really how useful or how widely commonly used that might be for those type of those data types. Um, depends on what you're, yeah, I mean, <coughs> if you're trying to do uh, internet to physical address lookups, it's probably pretty useful. Mm. Jeffrey Paul has a, a pretty good article about um, doing it on MySQL. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny, it's like the, uh, I mean, it started off with the, all the GIS implementations and like better ways to do it. And Simple feature in this. So I, I um, see that I have a couple of errors here. You know, misspelling merge joins in one and the and the uh, non affiliate subfolders. I those are actually from a different slide, and I those actually don't have anything to do with the new index you just. Oh, I was gonna like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the motion I had. What are you doing with index? So non affiliated subfolders. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so sorry about sorry about the uh, uh, misinformation on the slide there. Um. How many folks use, use sequences? They're terrible things. <laughs> terrible, terrible things. Well, as, as terrible as they might be. Um, the Lots of things want them. <laughs> yes. And um, an improvement has been made to create a new PG sequence system catalog table to help you find them. So now you can go to one place and see where all the sequences are in the database system as opposed to uh, Yes, and check. Uh, I mean, make your own query to query the system catalog table to say like, oh, these are all the sequence sizes I have. Now let me hunt down all the um, table IDs or join to the other catalog tables so I don't have to. Yeah. So if, if uh, folks have done that before, um, now you know you can just go to one place and, and uh, find all your sequences. Um, administration. Uh, how, how many folks are pretty strict on, on setting up proper rules and not giving uh, everyone super user privileges? So, uh, um, there's a, a few, four default rules now um, that you can, you can uh, use to make it easier to grant particular roles the ability to look at the stats table and the um, uh, What's the other one? Settings, yeah, settings and stats. So people can review what the uh, uh, database configuration settings are and, and the various index table database stats. How many folks look at the PG stat activity table on a regular basis? <laughs> so a uh, couple more things that you can inspect here. Um, latch weight states that is supposed to give you some idea of um, what the <coughs> client application is doing. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm not terribly familiar, but it's supposed to give you an idea if you're waiting on the client to send information with a, whether the client is still reading information from you. There is um, additional information on what the Postgres backend is doing with respect to, is it waiting for reads and writes? to the system, uh, if it, or if it's F-syncing. Um, in addition to queries being run, uh, the PG stat activity will also start showing more information about uh, the various backend worker processes. So different extensions, different, uh, well, I, I think basically that's it, uh, the extensions that you may be, in which may be running its own dedicated 
dynamically or, or statically um, running. We'll start giving more information about what those guys are doing. We'll, we'll start showing you what those guys are doing and it can be static or visual. Um, and along the same lines, uh, for folks using physical replication or just just using uh, anything that, well, it, basically any type of replication that's making use of the wall center, you'll be able to see what the wall center is doing in that if you stand next to the data now. Oh, yeah, so this is my misplaced slide. Scram um, SHA-256 support instead of MD5 sun. Uh, how many folks use logical re replication with Postgres? Physical replication? Have you wanted to use logical replication? Or? That's why I use MySQL. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to give it a try, though. But, uh, so I'm actually going to talk more about logical replication at, at 3.30, but in the past, uh, if you needed a logical replication, if, if physical replication of a whole Postgres cluster was too heavy-handed, for you. Uh, the beginning of built in, well, e, before I get there, uh, you'd have to use something like Swogi or Londis or Ricardo to name the big three, third, fourth one that I'm forgetting. But um, uh, those were your choices of, of getting physical, uh, sorry, logical replication. And uh, um, it is starting to get built into the core functionality of Postgres. How many folks um, make need synchronous standby? Any anyone use uh, uh, that functionality of Postgres? So um, then to just kind of quickly go over it, uh, when you set up a standby with Postgres, uh, if you uh, default setup is usually some sort of asynchronous thing. You you commit something on the master uh, the, before that is actually committed to any of the standbys in the cluster. Your application will actually the the um, transaction will complete from your application point of view, what, even though the standbys may still be committing data. So there are some use cases where people want to make sure that that whatever transaction is written to the master gets committed to all the standbys before your application is um, uh, before anything returns back to the application. So those were the two extremes, and there's now a I can't remember the general term for this feature, but the setting is going to be called synchronous standby name, where um, there's a few variations, but the general idea is that if you have five standbys and you want them all to be synchronous, you can set some, some kind of in-between. Instead of having to wait for all five standbys, yeah, yeah, on committee, you can, you can um, the master can continue on. You can say, well, uh, we're, we're actually okay if Two of the standbys commit, and then we'll let the let the master continue at that point, and then those other three can commit at, at um, whenever they get to it. It doesn't matter when they finish. There's a term for that, and it's from Erlang and other similar languages, but I can't remember what it is. Yeah, I think I think the one term I saw was some kind of. Um, it's like a majority within a quorum. Yeah, some quorum majority or uh, quorum, yeah, something yeah. with quorum in it. How many XML users or people who like like using work? Maybe I shouldn't say like. How many people have to work with XML data? Do you like working with XML data? <laughs> <laughs> so who uh, raised <laughs> I won't. I won't uh, write you out there. Uh, compared to what? <laughs> We're manually constructing complex hierarchical labels for JSON. Yeah, so yes, X XML brings out uh, the best in some people. <laughs> so uh, uh, XML table, I think, is a SQL standard term to uh, define a object, if you will, that represents XML data uh, that that you can um, query. So, um, as 
as you may know, Postgres has supported the XML data type as a column for, um, I don't know, was it version eight or something like that? But for, for a little while. But now um, you can actually create a table that represents, am I saying this the right way? That uh, have a table representation of XML data as opposed to have the XML data in a column. So um, I have a short example of you know, what XML data may look like, and I won't try to uh, uh, hurt your eyes too much with that. But so you can you can create a table given some XML, then um, using a type of uh, I keep wanting to call this some sort of uh, X path or X query type syntax. Um, but then you can select from your XML table, uh, specify some paths, what various, I'm not sure the terms, attributes of the XML data. Um, a bunch of stuff here, if you don't mind me glossing over that. And um, uh, basically uh, get a table back instead of a blob of XML text. Or uh, Postgres did provide some functions to pull out various parts of the XML data, but but now you can you can actually get a uh, row set row set row, basically get what you would expect any table to come back as with um, this nicely constructed XML type looking thing with uh, uh, XML table defined syntax. Um, two o'clock a.m. time, right? All right. And that, is it two o'clock a.m. time or the start time for the night? Uh, start, start time is 2.15. 2.15, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, couple more helper functions in Postgres. Uh, how, many, how many folks have had to connect to the database and ask it to remind you where you put the log directory or put the, um, uh, well, yeah, put the log directory. That's have, uh, then a um, couple more helpful functions. You can just call a function. It'll tell you where the path is to your log directory or your transaction log. Um, how many folks script stuff using PSQL? Now you get to use, um, uh, what's the term? Conditional branches. You can set up some if, if else, uh, make your scripts a little more uh, powerful, a little more versatile. Um, how many times have you had to dump your rules and wish the password didn't show up in it? <coughs> or um, had to dump out a lot of rules <coughs> and spend a lot of time scraping those passwords out of it? <laughs> so you get a little help here now. Uh, anyone make use of that? Postgres foreign data wrapper? Yeah. If, um, if you start doing it, uh, now uh, you, you may be aware that there are certain levels or certain things that are optimized. For example, if, if you were to do some complicated, complicated multi-join query, um, in the old days, the original days, it would actually be querying those tables individually and then doing the join on the local server. And then over time, they added that feature such that um, the joins can be done on, the joins would actually be done on the remote server if it, if it was possible, and then sending down the reduced result set. Now you can expect the aggregates to run on the remote server, if it makes sense, instead of having to pull all that data and then aggregating it there. Plus, um, this also keeps in mind that uh, it shouldn't assume that the other server is necessarily faster. Uh, you can actually tell it, say, no, no, don't, don't push down the work, pull it all back because it'll be faster for you to just send it to me and run it on the system. So um, more things to expect if, if you're using some of those forward data wrappers. Then, and I, I mentioned the Postgres forward data wrapper specifically, but this ability can be done by other foreign data wrappers. It's just whether or not 
it's physically possible or whether it actually has to be coded into the other foreign data wrapper that they take advantage of, of being able to do something like this. And that was my subset of the features coming up to share with you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.